Well, it's two o'clock, guys. I'll get started here. The sooner I get started, the sooner the raffle starts, and I think there's maybe some beverages after that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, introduce myself briefly. Brandon Bolig. I'm with the Scala Motoman Robotics. Uh, been in the robotics industry since uh, 2004. Worked for integrators uh, prior to coming to uh, OEM at Yaskawa here. And uh, I would say the last 10 years, my major focus has been welding application. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what to automate and why in, in general terms. Um, I've got a bunch of different slides. You're going to see me jump over some probably, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump around possibly a little bit, but I don't want it to be me standing up here talking. So if you have questions or there's something specific, something I didn't hit on, let me know. Um, so with that, we will uh, down, right? There we go. So with that, key points, why should I automate? Where do I start and what is a good part or what can I automate? How do I measure the return on investment? Uh, how do I make sure I'm maximizing the investment? And then uh, I'll hit very briefly, there's a few slides, but I'm gonna jump over a few on, on just what's to be expected from a maintenance perspective. And then um, what's not on this agenda, I, I wanna kinda get the group input. I've got some slides specific to welding content, whether it be positioners, arms, whatever, I wanna kinda talk through that. So keep it open for them. So why automate? Obviously, um, there's a whole variety of answers to that question. Um, increase quality and reduce scrap and waste and then labor generally are top of the heap. But not all of these are gonna fit everyone, but generally everyone can find enough of this to justify a system. Just depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, kind of a continuation. Um, in terms of payback time, generally the increased quality, uh, increased safety, and reducing scrap are the quickest ways of attaining payback, but you've got some cost reduction, labor savings, um, flexibility, ability to attract new business because you're, you're gaining throughput and efficiency. Um, those are also factors. Sometimes take a little longer to actually pay back. Obviously, anyone in manufacturing knows and anyone that's watching the news at all, unemployment is low, it's hard to find workers, extremely hard to find skilled labor in the welding space. Um, American Welding Society says there's a, welding sh a welder shortage of between 350 and 400,000 and there are not students going into that space. It's just nobody wants to take on that trade. Um, at least not in the numbers that we need. So that drives us to robotic welding. Um, some of the other factors uh, on the why should I automate. Um, supply chain visibility, we all kind of saw through COVID that that's a, a risk. Um, only 6% of customers uh, in this supply chain study and statistics had good visibility of what their supply chain looked like. That's why everyone went into panic mode. Um, and then the, uh, the final stat there, the 48.5% increase on, uh, or import fuel increases. We see it, I see it, our robots are built in Japan, shipped to the US, pipelined over our freight costs went through the roof. What used to cost 5,000 bucks for a container of robots was costing 25, 30, 40,000 dollars. It's crazy. So being able to build product in your facility more efficiently can help save on, on that. Safety is obviously another area. Um, the welding environment in general, you're in leathers, you're under a hood, you're hot, it's just not a, you know, not the greatest environment, so um, you know there's good good payback through the gains in safety. Robotic trends in general, so this is uh, based on um, automotive industry. Historically, 
has been the leader and the largest utilizer of robots. And in 2020, 2021, was the first year that general industry surpassed automotive and automation. And that's across the board, not just welding. But uh, the automotive industry has always been kind of the benchmark for robotic OEMs because that's where the volume of arms are used uh, or historically has been. But we're seeing that, that change. General industry, lower volume, higher mix is, uh, is becoming a, a bigger player. Uh, I'm going to skip by this. Uh, I'll hit on this quickly. Obviously, customers that have integrated systems for... Um, Automation in general, but specifically welding, um, reduced cost is generally the quickest, the, the number one answer as to why did the automate, with quality improvement being number two. That's kind of a resounding theme in the last few slides. Let's see. Where do I start and what can I automate? So it's the four Ds, the dull, dirty, dangerous, and dear. Um, hard to find general labor that wants to do dull, boring jobs. Nobody wants to get dirty anymore. Everybody wants to sit behind a desk and make the big bucks and not, uh, not do the work out on the floor. Uh, obviously, with all the, the safety concerns, uh, anything dangerous, foundry applications, high heat environment, and then deer specialized processes. If it's hard to control that human error, human input, that's a, that's a, a good application to automate. While I'm on this slide, we'll hit on specific to welding. So. How many in here have or will have? So I know you guys, Diamond customer, has a weld system. I see camp. So most all you guys integrators or end users? Integrators. Okay, that'll change what I, how I go at this a little bit. <laughs> um, so you get all this. How many of you guys integrate welding robots currently? Okay. What is the, when you guys go in and are looking at an application on the welding side of things, what's generally, what do you look at first, whether it's a good project or not? Pick on you a little bit. Yep. Some of the peripheral processes that need to happen, and then reach, obviously, you know, yeah. the key is saving floor space for the customer. Yeah. If it's too big, of a, it's going to take up more floor space to add a robot welder than what they're currently doing it. Yeah. Kill some ROI. One of the first things I look at, those are all perfect examples of things to look at first, but one of the first things I look at is how are they welding it today? So they have 10 guys on it, and are they using big pry bars and clamping and pulling and pushing, not really using fixturing, measuring with a tape measure? If that's what they're doing today, and they're not willing to invest in tooling and fixturing and good piece parts coming in, run. <laughs> run like the wind. It's going to be a struggle. Um, good part fit up is crucial to a successful welding integration. Um, we typically recommend uh, gap conditions, no more than half wire diameter. So if you're welding with 045 wire, you know, what you got to deal with for a gap is not very much. Can we work around that? Absolutely, we can work around that, but it's gotta be consistent. So if you give me a gap that's a eighth inch, but it's an eighth inch all the time, I can do weld parameters and figure out how to make that weld as long as it's consistent. But if it goes from no gap to eighth inch and it's changing all the time, you'll never be successful with that or it'll be very challenging. Um, so I, this, I may jump around a little bit more here thinking about the, the audience, but um, I guess I'll, uh, well, I'll work through. but. Uh, so obviously, can the task be automated? One of the first questions you gotta ask when you look at a new application. Is labor difficult to find? Because if you're struggling to find labor to do that job, you're gonna figure out a way to get the automation to work. Um, workplace improvement, that's, a, that's always takes place. Um, is the market for your product highly competitive? 
So if you can save pennies on a part or dollars on a part compared to doing it manual, then it's going to be worthwhile. And then is the payback time achievable? Um, where to start? There's a whole host of applications. With all you guys being integrators, you looked at most of this. Um, welding at the top, that's what brought auto robots specifically to the US market was welding in the auto industry. So uh, that's always top of the list. Um, all the way down to simple pick and paste, place palletizing. Um, but uh, so ROI, obviously, uh, as, as integrators and as end customers, because I know that the guys at Diamond right now are going through ROI to validate a new project, right? And looking at what that cost ends up being. Um, I think all you guys probably know how to run an ROI calculator, so I probably won't waste time on that unless anyone specifically wants to go through that. I thought there would be more end users, so I was planning on going through an ROI calculator, but I probably will skip that. We good? Okay. Um, obviously, there's a wide variety of uh, ways to attack a, an application from the down and dirty, simple cobot welding type scenario to pre-engineered standard product type solutions, um, and then all the way up to full line custom systems. Um, obviously, generally, the, the higher the customization, the longer the payback, but that's not always the case uh, if you get the efficiency. Let me... Uh, Ask the question, <laughs> what do you guys want to, what do you want to hit on? What did you hope to learn coming into the room today? I'll, I'll jump around a little bit. If anybody's got anything specific they were hoping to, to glean from this. Nothing? Want to learn about Yaskawa products? or more application stuff. I should bring my laptop in, <laughs> sorry, I won't do it. Matt will go sideways, but I can just go through a bunch of videos. Um, we'll hit on some product stuff. Um, well, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit because I think it's as important for integrators to talk to your customers about um, as it is for me to talk to end users about it, but it's really developing a work cell champion. So, First time automation customer, if there's not a work cell champion in that building, it doesn't matter if it's a welding application or pick and place or what it is, the potential for that system to operate efficiently goes down dramatically if there's not someone that's kind of deemed as the champion, somebody that wants to take ownership of that. So what does the work cell champion do? Ensures that it's fully utilized and that the system is successful. They take it account, it, it, take into account its success personally, and they, they, they want to own the cell. Uh, they're responsible for it, uh, and then there, there's got to be some measurable and quantitative goals. Um, a lot of times it's uh, combined in with maybe some incentives, pay increases, whatever the case may be. Um, but getting that one person, and generally in the welding space, uh, I have most success taking a welder, somebody that was under the hood, putting wire in a joint and making them the work cell champion because their job just got easier. Um, and they, they can they take some pride in their work. They still have control of the quality of the part coming out because a lot of welders today are a little bit, they think of themselves as, as artists a little bit. They take pride in their ability to weld. So taking pride in making sure the parameters are right, what the robot's doing is a big deal to them. So if I have my choice and I'm walking into a new customer, did it with you guys, what, year and a half, two years ago? Walked in, talked about who's, who's gonna be your champion. You had the guy, he's not even there anymore, is he? But there's been another one that stepped in his place and it was better, yeah. So having that work cell champion is huge. Uh, pick the champion, you gotta make sure that they have adequate training, um, equip and enable them with the tools needed to do their job, whether that's simulation software, whatever the case may be. I have a question on this topic. 
Yeah. What is your best method of convincing the end customer to chase getting a champion with the system? I've had home team and integration projects over the years where this factory wants to rotate a guy. Every three weeks, he changes stations, and then you end up with the whole, I forgot how to do it every three weeks. And then I, you know, as an integrator, we're getting phone calls being like, the system's not working, and they yeah. just don't remember how to operate it. Way to get you know the production manager or someone to buy into. Hey, we got to change your process a little, and someone's just going to live with the robot and embrace it, like you're saying. I think that uh, to answer your question specifically, I've not come across that exact scenario, but plenty of times we see that it, it's not, not maybe not specifically that revolving scenario, but it, it's not consistent. It's in inconsistent operators. Um, it's just sitting down having the hard conversation. And I have had the candid conversation with some customers, even with the people in the room. Like, this guy is really good at doing this, but he is not the right guy to run the robot cell. And even that guy oftentimes is saying, yeah, I don't really want to be that guy. So we have to figure out who the right person is, a guy, gal, I shouldn't say guy, I guess, but um, it, it, it's a tricky, a tricky scenario. I don't think there's any one answer that, that's going to nail it uh, every time. I, th I think it's, I it's fluid. You. you don't have the champion on a cell, it's, it just immediately puts that sour taste to automation in some companies. <coughs> no one owned it and was yep. proud of what the robot was doing. One of the biggest red flags for me on, the, on a potential sale uh, or a potential new customer is when the customer wants no responsibility for the process or, or any, they want a complete turnkey, they want to push the button and have it go. I typically go at those in a much different fashion than when the customer wants to take ownership wants to be a part of the process, wants to be engaged into the scenario, into the development of the cell, the building of the cell, the programming of the parts. Um, when somebody wants a turnkey, we can give them that turnkey and it will weld that part perfect, but as soon as they gotta make a change and we're not there looking over their shoulder, then you're getting the phone calls and um, it's usually a, another candid conversation that takes place right, right out of the gate early on. Uh, you got to have some tools to measure. You got to put that on your customer that they've got to have some tools to measure their success. How do they know that it's going to be successful if they don't have any metrics in place? Uh, and then the motivation factor and, and then broadening the scope, because generally what happens is you, you get that champion developed. Um, he gets to the point where the, maybe the first system is up and running, it's making production, it's paid for itself. It always becomes, you know, it's the best part of selling robots, they make babies, right? When you sell one, you usually are gonna sell another. And that's the, that's the beauty of having that work sell champion because now he's working on the next project in his head even before maybe I as a sales guy or you guys as sales guys or apps engineers even know they're looking at it. I'm just gonna kinda skip through this. You guys get it, uh, robots in general, there's not a lot for maintenance and spares couple grand a year budgeted and then once you get 15 10 15 years think about a harness and things like that but technology is changing so damn fast now that it seems that it's not the hardware that fails it's there's something newer faster better that uh, that has taken its place so um, I don't see a lot of systems being pulled out of production because they're dying they're still able to produce parts they're just not producing them fast enough compared to what is out there um, so. so I had some Yaskawa corporate stuff in here. I'll do a really quick 30 second overview just so anybody that doesn't know Yaskawa can have a little understanding. A um, hundred plus year old company, four and a half billion dollar company based out of Kitakushu, Japan. Uh, our U.S. headquarters in Dayton, Ohio. We have offices globally. Um, obviously, the 
the Yaskawa robot is just a really nice way to package multiple motors and drives because that's ultimately what our parent company wants to sell is motors and drives. They could really care less about the castings that link all those joints. That's just a cost. Um, it's motors and drives. So here in the U.S., we're about 650, or in North America, we're about 650 employees. Adding on uh, another, so our headquarters in Ohio is 300 square, 300,000 square feet today. We're adding on 200,000 more next year or later this year. Um, and jump through some of this service and support, 24/7 call support, just like pretty much everywhere. Uh, 30 million in spare parts. Got a phenomenal training facility. So um, over 75 different programs, 65 different robots in the training program. It's I'd say second to none out there right now from an OEM perspective. Uh, we also will do training on site if need be. Mechatronics offers some training here. We can actually bring our trainer in and host a course here if they've got robots on their floor. Uh, so there's options there. Chad does a good job of training though too. Uh, da -da -da -da. So welding technologies. So when it comes to welding robots, I have a, a variety from small little tabletop size uh, offset torch, you know, traditional flange mounted offset torch to uh, three plus meter reach or AR3120 um, and pretty much every reach in between there. The difference between our material handling robots and our welding robots from a control perspective, excuse me, there, there really is none. Um, it's a different overlay on the pendant and some different software and parameters. So your um, gripper open close on a handling robot is arc start buttons on a welding robot pendant. It's, it's very similar. So that's one of the best things that, that I get to sell on is, okay, if you want to weld, we've got that and we do it well. If you want to do material handling, we've got that and we do it well. So we've got the whole product lineup. And from a OEM manufacturer perspective, there's no one else in the market that builds as many positioners and, and uh, standard weld cells as Yaskawa. So maybe what I'll do, um, I want to hit on this one. So. Thermal advantages, since this is supposed to be a welding seminar or welding discussion. Um, a lot of the robot OEMs out there kind of standardize on one particular weld power supply and, and cater to that. We don't care. I probably sell more Miller than anything, but that's because my customers know Miller and my customers are comfortable with Miller. My interface to the Lincoln or the Fronius or the SKS is just as good as it is with the Miller all of the same features and functions that you would have on the, on the manual welder or, the, or on any particular model or brand, you will have all those features and functions right on the pendant. Uh, so only brands that support, or is that other brands that you guys support? So I was just gonna say, if there's others out there, I mean, I Hobart is Miller. Yep. We, kind of yep. Yeah. we can we can work with ESOB. Um, actually, SKS is an interesting one. I I haven't sold one yet, but we we've got some of their demo equipment, and I always thought that Fronius had some of the best aluminum processes. SKS is right up there, but they don't offer a manual machine. It's only automated, so there's nobody that really, unless you're robotically welding, nobody really knows about it. So. It's hard to sell on that. It's, it's just a, a different animal. In terms of our universal weld interface, so um, you set up all your arc condition files right on the pendant. You have the ability to set up torch angles. You have ability to lock things in, uh, in terms of what the operator can adjust or not adjust. Uh, there's multiple different ways you can call your parameters. You can call them globally or locally from the, from the parameter set or call them independently in the job. Um, just a really clean, 
it's, I, I feel it's what sets us apart uh, in the welding space. Along with the positioners, and I'm gonna just go back, oops. So there we go. So I don't know if any of you guys ever looked on our website. Um, there's a few bits and pieces that maybe we should have a little more detail on, but in general, um, This flip brochure is kind of a, a good way to get an idea, but all of, all of these are different types of work cells and different configurations to address welding applications in a, in a standard cell configuration. So anything from, uh, if you saw the small little side-by-side -side cell that Mechatronics builds the platform for, we call that our ArcWorld LC. That's partnership that we do with them. They actually supply us with that for all of our standards on, of, that, of that configuration. Um, but single station, dual station, headstock, tailstock, this is a, a rotating, uh, basically a turntable type cell, ArcWorld 1000. Um, that used to be a big hit, but we see less and less of it. More and more people want part rotation capabilities. So, I have sold a couple of those that have positioners on top of them, but when you start to spend that kind of money, you're better off looking at kind of the Ferris wheel type system. That's probably our number one seller. It's an over under Ferris wheel. We can do it in uh, 750 kilogram per side. Um, do it in single robot up to triple robot. We've done them in quads before with two down below and two overhead. Um, our number one seller by far. Anywhere from, like I said, 750 kilogram payload per side up to 2850 now, almost 3000 kg per side. Got a, we used to call it a Fab World, now we call it an Arc World 2000. It's kind of a back to back, robots in the middle, they can work on each side. Um, good for job shops, lower volume, higher mix. Uh, a little bit clunkier from an operator perspective because that operator footstep is, if you're running it with one person, you got a guy going from one side to the other. A little bit of a, a challenge there, but I do have a lot of customers that will run it kind of in a flow through scenario. So I think the laser pointer on here. So if you can imagine product running kind of this direction on each side and they'll put an operator on each side and run it down the middle of the plant. Um, then you don't have the operator running from side to side, but it's, it's flexible in the sense that there's nothing defining the width or the span of that cell other than some safeguarding. So if you bought it as a two meter cell because that's the parts you had to run and year down the road, you got a three or four meter part that you want to put in there, you can literally just kick it out if, if you've got uh, the reach with the arms or you can add a second arm. In terms of spot welding, um, <clears throat> not really there, but we don't see it. So actually, I'm gonna we'll talk about spot, and then we'll talk about the different positioners a little bit. We just don't see spot welding too much up here. It's more in the auto space, maybe a little bit in the appliance manufacturing. A couple different ways to do it, whether it's robot mounted spot gun or a pedestal mounted, and you're using the robot to just index the part under an existing spot head. Um, We've got our own called a Gizu. It's the dress out kit that brings all the spot hardware up through the arm. Um, so any, any spot hardware from any major manufacturer can be bolted to the arm and then connected up to our standard Gizu. Um, in terms of positioners, I mentioned there's a whole variety. We've got the turntables, the Ferris wheels, some, uh, some H frame. We actually have a VMF five axis where it'll rotate, spin and tilt. Um, 
headstocks that can be bolted together to make any configuration that you want, tracks, overhead, gantry, basically. If you need it in the welding space, we either have it or have a partner that, that builds it for us. Um, we're a half hour, but the group's a little different than anticipated, so I don't know. I, again, is there anything specific that, uh, that you guys had hoped to learn or garner from this conversation or presentation? Perfect. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, so we touched on that just a tiny bit early, but we can go into a little more detail there. Um, components coming into the weld cell are hugely important. So if, if you're consistent process upstream and you're loading in consistent pieces into the weldment and you're not having to heat and beat and grind and pound, that's, that's obviously a, a good place to start. If you see guys with clamps and pry bars and torches and trying to get things fit so they can get it tacked together and then come back and weld it, that's not going to be a good robotic application. Consistent joint fit up is crucial. Um, when I look at robot projects in general, I tend to look at weld content on the part and what type of cell and how do you want to set it up, right? So if you have a million parts that only have two inches of weld on them, that's a different system than if you have, uh, you know, 20 parts that have a ton of weld content on them. So uh, generally, I like to start new customers. Some listen to this, some don't. I like to start with the easier, right? Let's crawl, walk, run. Let's find some small pieces. Let's figure out what type of work cell I can justify. Let's, let's work together in that process. So. I generally do like a spreadsheet uh, cycle time estimate. Like if I know how many welds, how many starts and stops, I can assume that I'm gonna wanna do some touch sensing on a percentage of the joints in the weldment. I can then lay out a little roadmap of, okay, these eight parts are gonna utilize this cell at 80% or whatever the number is. Well, that's a pretty good starting point to, to get onto the budget conversation. Now I look at those eight parts and I say, of those eight parts, how many of them fit together real well? How many of them do we have good gap control and can we control the, the weldment itself? Um, and then just start, start working from there. But really the factors are amount of wire in the joint and how well the part fits. And whether they're, if the parts fit good, but they're not using fixed string today because they don't have to because they fit so well, like some people are using tab and slot and they're laser cut parts that are tabbed and slotted and they're barely using fixtures because the tabs and slots hold everything together the way they need them to. I mean, that's a, that's a great starting point because you know those components coming into that cell are going to fit up. We go to one thing that we're seeing right now, I'm seeing at least... Uh, and a lot of my customers that have been welding for 20 plus years, they've, they've got the welding perfected, but the way that they've done it for a long time has been to throw an operator in front of that weld cell. Well, I have plenty of customers out there right now that can't run their weld cells because they can't find enough operators. So we're looking at robotically loading weld cells, robotically loading fixtures, or robotically loading tacking stations, tacking with the robot, taking a material handling robot and then loading a finished weld station. That's more and more prevalent in the last two years. There's some major manufacturers within the upper Midwest that are investing heavily into that type of process. Um, but in that scenario, tab and slot doesn't always work very well because if you're taking a material handling robot and you're trying to fit a tab and a slot and there's any variation, any burr, an operator that sees that can address that real easily. So a robot trying to stick that tab into that slot that's got a burr on it, it doesn't fit, now you're crashing robots, it's no good. 
So we're actually going to the extent of removing a lot of the tabs and slots and doing some light tack fixturing that allows us to go in and get things tacked to the self-supporting state and then load them into a finished weld cell because that's another big factor of robotic welding is how can I hold the part and also weld it, right? Because if you're trying to hold datum points and, and joints in the right location, you may be blocking torch access to that, to that space. So um, kind of rambled a lot there, but that's it, it sort of break it down to what is the part, what do the parts look like coming into the cell? And are they using fixturing today or not? Um, obviously the more weld content, um, the better the, the utilization of the cell. However, a lot of short welds, so a bigger part with a lot of shorter welds, you're gonna likely see the biggest gain in throughput because that's where the operator, if a manual welder is welding within his little bubble here, he's probably barely lifting his hood up, he's doing his welds and he's moving his part on and getting the next one. But if he's climbing all over a bigger part, you got a lot of inefficiency. He does one weld over here that's six inches. He flips his hood. He walks over here. He moves. He grabs a drink of water. He talks to his buddy over there. He flips his hood down. It's not very efficient. That's where the robot, you're just, you know, it's way, way better. How about cobot welding as integrators? You guys looking at cobot welding at all? Anyone? an interesting space because there's nothing really collaborative about welding. You have a hot wire sticking out of a torch. You can do some things to get around that. Obviously the market has done that. Um, my challenge with cobot welding is I think it's a good application if you're doing like a hard surfacing where you're just laying a bunch of weld in a small space and you can teach an array to a cobot and just let it go back and forth. Great application. But loading a lot of parts in and out of a cobot weld cell, from my personal perspective, an industrial robot can get that job done probably cheaper and faster. Um, yes, there's some guarding around it, but you can do a small, even a wheeled cell with an industrial arm and uh, probably better fit the application. I'm just curious if anybody had any experience with that. Any other questions, thoughts? Comments? Go ahead, Kyle. In your experience on what are like typical or other customers getting for like payback period? Like, I saw you have a slide up there, 18 months. Is that an average normal? I would say 18 months is a pretty good target. I have some customers that um, less than a year is very doable. And I have others where it's they're okay with three year. There's some big players like very large manufacturers that are in remote areas that are extending their justification period on new new equipment purchases to five years because they know it's a seven to 15 year asset and they have literally cannot find enough labor so if the robot takes five years or the system takes five years to pay for itself they're still spending the money they don't love it but they're willing to do it so I would say, on average, that 18 months is a pretty good, a pretty good window.